Tadio Sagalo works for Facebook on the React Native team. Tadio, welcome to Software Engineering Daily. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, yeah, it's very good to be here. Great. So let's start off by talking about native mobile application development in general. We're going to talk about React Native eventually, but I want to start with why is the native mobile environment inherently so difficult? Yeah, so there's a few things that makes it harder than, than the web development. I think one big thing at Facebook is uh, the time wasted while compiling the apps. So once you start getting your apps get bigger and bigger, uh, the compile time goes quite fast from from a few seconds, one minute to to ten, fifteen minutes, and the time wasted in engineering is uh, it's considerably high. So yeah. So how does that affect development velocity relative to the web developers? Yeah, most of the web developers nowadays just like live reload, live reload and hot reloading. It's like it's completely different, two extremes. So yeah, if you think like if every time you have to recompile your app, you waste uh, even if it's like a uh, if it's not a code start, it still takes like more than one minute. And every time you have to like do very small changes, it's a lot of engineering time wasted. Facebook was originally just a website. Why did you need to build mobile apps? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, yeah, uh, actually, it started as with web views. They called it FaceWeb, and for engineering, for engineers, it was a better experience. The developer experience better because you can still use the web development tools, but it's kind of a trade off. Uh, you have a better developer experience, but you sacrifice your user experience, and yeah, it's it's not fair with the users as well. So, well, so what are the problems with building web view based mobile apps? Well, there's some things that usually don't feel right. Uh, touch events is something very very hard to get right. So, touch events scrolling, uh, it's it's much much slower. So if you have a very rich experience in your app, animations and it's it's very easy to to lose FPS and have like it's much much harder to have a smooth experience, smooth richer experience. So I kind of understand that on a high level, the touch events and the scrolling, but at a lower level, what does the mobile operating system have available to it that the browser does not have? Uh a lot of the the resources like APIs are can be exposed to native like uh, like the normal phone accessories like uh, geolocation and that's not the problem. But if you want to build something like lower level like OpenGL and uh, richer animations, it's yeah it's it's not available from to a web view in any way. So why doesn't the web have a more sophisticated threading model? Uh, yeah, that's a very hard question, I guess. Uh, yeah, they're working on that, right? But it's it's always been a single thread. Uh, JavaScript is not a multi-threading language. They have web workers, but yeah, it's not it's not quite there yet. Uh, they have, I think, they have like a a proposal for shared locking locked memory between web workers and your main process that should make it uh much less expensive to to have multi-threading multi-threading mm. on the web so interesting that should help so let's start getting into the weeds of native application development what is component kit so component kit is something uh it's also an open source project developed by Facebook. Uh, it's written in Objective C++. And it's, in some sense, it's similar to React Native. Uh, the, the, the goals are similar to, to React Native. So you have like uh, a layout system that's similar to, to Flexbox. It's not exactly the same thing, I guess. I haven't used it completely, to, to be honest, but yeah, I, I know the, the basics of the project. So you have like a synchronous rendering and uh, you have a very uh, much, much simpler layout uh, layout engine 
And as the name suggests, as the name suggests, it's uh, based on components. So you have like composed application, composable applications. So what what was the problem that Component Kit was trying to solve originally? Doing like UI in in, in iOS is super hard. Uh, if you want to, you have like the interface based like the guy for 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 building applications, the interface builder. But yeah, it's it usually doesn't doesn't uh, work in bigger apps as far as I know. So, it, and so, so yeah, Compon- it, Component Kit was was kind of an effort that was. Uh, you know, launched prior to uh, React Native, if if I'm correct. I mean, were, was there a lot of hope placed in Component Kit? Like, were, were was Facebook thinking that this would be uh, a, a more broad solution to mobile native development? So the applications built with Component Kit, like, uh, Component Kit, is more performant right now. So Components is is widely used in the Facebook main application. And the more major framework, I think. Mm. So they they're both being used in, in, at the same time in Facebook. They solve different problems and in a similar way. But yeah, it's a it's it's serious. It's not something that Facebook launched and just abandoned. Abandoned, <laughs> sorry. So yeah, it's it's still being used. There's a, there's a lot of people working on that as well. Uh, they are kind of two separate efforts. Uh, Trying to solve similar problems in similar ways, but they are very they're, they're very different. Interesting. So, with that preface said, what is React Native? So, React Native is a framework uh, for writing native apps using React. Uh, yeah, it allows now now you can develop both iOS and Android apps using React JS. On, with the framework that itself is called React Native. What, what is the story behind React Native? Uh, yeah, it started in a hackathon at Facebook. Uh, React solved a lot of problems for, for the web development, Facebook. And they wanted to, to, to also be able to, to use all that cool stuff on mobile development as well. So they started this hackathon project of getting uh, React running on... On, on iOS first, and at first it was like uh, based on web views. There was no JavaScript core API available for iOS yet, and it's been about two years now. And yeah, we're quite far from that already. Is React Native a language in and of itself? Uh, no, it's a it's a framework uh, based on on React JS. So it's your application code is written mostly in JavaScript. Uh, you can, and sometimes you will need to write some native code. You can have like native uh, native code and use that from the JavaScript side. So the experience is like Java is uh, JavaScript code interspersed with native iOS code, for example. Yes, uh, the idea is. is is mostly using JavaScript. Uh, it might happen that you need to write some native code, but yeah, the idea is that you should be able to to spend most of your development of your development time just writing JavaScript. So, where is the JavaScript translated into native code? Uh, it's not exactly translated. So, the way it works that we have the JavaScript running on a separate thread. It runs on the on the Apple's VM called JavaScript Core. So all your code's running and React uh, does runs the reconciliation algorithm once you render something, and that gives you gives us a diff of uh, what has to be done on the UI. So what views have to be created, updated, or deleted, and that's passed as a JSON to the native side. And then uh, we have the UI manager, it's called, that uh, manages these views and creates updates and, de- does, and deletes. Sorry. Is that JavaScript virtual machine expensive to run? Uh, n- not much. Uh, so we use the butane, so we don't ship the VM. Uh, it doesn't incur any binary size. You don't have to add anything. 
uh, Apple provides that. Of course, you have another. Uh, you have the VM running. You have some. You have to load all the code in the VM, but uh, it's not very expensive. Okay, interesting. Um, and so, I guess I'm still not clear. Is it a like a just in time compilation model, or is everything compiled at once and then it and then it runs? So no, I mean there's no there's no compilation step to okay. to, to be honest. So it's, it's just uh, it's as if it were two separate processes. It's not like a process in a sense of AOS process. Uh, it's just like the code is running on two separate threads and they talk to each other via JSON. So yeah. Okay, I see. So so prior to the application being run, the JavaScript is compiled to. Uh, to I guess uh, some sort of bytecode, and then the iOS is also uh, what is it? I- I- iOS? Does iOS um, does Objective C it just compiles to a binary, or do they both yeah. compile to binaries? No, 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 no. Uh, the Objective C code is compiled to, to binary. It just generates a mic- micro binary. Okay. And yeah, that's how any other iOS app would run. The JavaScript uh, is not compiled at all, so it's just a JavaScript files in a text file. Or we just load as a string and feed that into the VM, and yeah, then the VM does some optimizations, of course, but we don't compile it to bytecode or, or anything like that. Okay, so uh, I mean, just to be clear, what is the output of the VM? Like, what does that look like? Is it's operating system level binary code or? Uh, so I mean, there's no output for us, right? So the VM is just running, and the only output you can get is text output. Uh, oh, inside, right, 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 okay. Inside the VM, uh, yeah, the way JavaScript core works is that it has like four tiers. The first one is an interpreter, so it's just like uh, reads the JavaScript, translates it to an intermediate representation, and then executes that. Uh, the second level is a level 1 JIT. You have a level 2 JIT and a level 3 JIT that actually compiles to, to bytecode. But on iOS, the JIT's not available, so that's a, a, an iOS limitation. iOS doesn't allow any JITing, so unless it's in a different process, but that's a, another story. So as I'm running my React Native app, I have this VM running that's consuming this JavaScript, and it's communicating with my native code through message passing of JSON. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. So what is the message passing interface between the VM and the native code? So mostly it's a, it, they follow the format. Like once you call something on native side, if you call a native module, as, as we call it, uh, a call will be enqueued and will be transferred to JavaScript with the, the, the module you called, the method you called, and the arguments that were passed. And that's transferred to, to, to JavaScript and uh, we have the other side of, of the bridge in JavaScript that reads that JSON and, and calls uh, what whatever was enqueued in that message. And the same goes to the other way around. Once you call a native module in JavaScript, it will put in the same queue and will do the same thing on the other side. So, yeah. So it's can a two-way you, communication process. Can you give an example of how a developer would lay out the two sides of these of this bridge, like what, like if I want to build a React native application, I want one side of it to be, you know, written in JavaScript, one side of it's written, or one side of it has some native code. Um, like, how do I architect an application, or what's a what's a simple example? Uh, yeah, one simple example is, uh, let me think the simplest one. Uh, yeah, geolocation is a, it's a built-in module that you can use, and it's implemented like that. So once you implement something on the native side, we have some macros to, to, that you have to put in our code. And you just need to implement it to implement it in the native side, and it will be available in JavaScript automatically. So we do some code generation uh, at runtime. And JavaScript will create that module that, with that shape at runtime. So let's say if you create the module that's called geolocation, and it has a, mod, a method that's uh, get position. So the JavaScript will read the shape of that object that will contain the name and the methods it has, and it will generate an object with that methods. And then once you call that in JavaScript, it 
already has the logic of sending the message across, across a bridge. So you don't have to do any coding uh, around message passing. Interesting. So if I just want to write like some ad hoc JavaScript scripting for my React Native application, uh, I mean, is that is that a is that something I can do? Is that is that a frequent practice? Like just you know, write an external method in JavaScript and then just uh, interface with the message passing API to accompany the native code. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's it's all right. You can have like a we we actually have that a lot. So we have like for every native module that we have implemented in native, we have a counterpart a counterpart in JS that does some some nice uh, checks like. Usually they are flow annotated and they, they will check all that stuff once you call. So you can have like better errors than just some crash to, to an invalid type or something like that. You said flow annotated. What is flow? Flow is a static type checker for JavaScript that's also written by Facebook and is open source. Uh, it gives a yeah, type annotation for JavaScript that allows you to check uh, statically, if you have some type errors or not, it also does a lot of type inference. That's very helpful. So you don't have to uh, to start using that. You don't have to just refactor your your whole code and add types to everything. It's it's, it's pretty smart. So interesting. Uh, and so listeners who may be interested in that could check out the we did an episode about TypeScript. I think TypeScript has bears some similarity to flow um, yeah just... yeah it's a project that tries to, to achieve the same goals it's a little bit different but yeah it's definitely similar. right it's like annotations versus actual uh language level typing yeah exactly so um what types of javascript maybe this is a naive question but what types of javascript would not be compatible with react native uh anything that relies on the dom so if you try to access stuff like user agent, uh, a lot of browser specific things, uh, they just don't exist. Like user agent or location, that kind of things that are very specific to the browser, just as a uh, document and all uh, the methods like query selector or anything like that that's specific to the DOM, we don't have, of course. Okay, and could you, Describe the RCT bridge module interface. <laughs> yeah, that that's actually uh, the the whole the whole uh, message passing thing. Yes. So the way the bridge module works that so once when you create a an, a module a native module that might be a, like geolocation for instance, you have to annotate it with a macro that's called RCT export module. And that will talk to the bridge to register that module at load time. So once your application is loaded into memory, the native side, it will notify the bridge that that module exists so the bridge can, can know about it. So once you will create a bridge, so when you create a React Native instance, it has a bridge and it will go through all that modules and instantiate them so it can know uh, which methods they have. So it can validate once you, they get a message the message gets first at the bridge, and it checks its own modules to see if if it knows about that module and that method that JavaScript is trying to call. How does a developer create an iOS module in React Native? So yeah, an iOS module is just basically a a, a Objective C class. So it has to 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 implement the RCT bridge module protocol that's just a an objective c protocol so the bridge can can know about it and it has to have these macros that i mentioned the first one is rct export module so the bridge knows about the module and any method that you would like to be able to that you would like to call from javascript they have to be annotated with rct export method rct export method is, tells the bridge that that method can be called from javascript what about views? How can I create an iOS view using React Native? Uh, the process is very similar, uh, but we have a base view manager. So the view manager knows how to create its own views. So you, for a very simple view, like for a switch, 
like an iOS switch. We have like a RST switch manager. I think that's the name. Uh, yeah. And the view is actually called RC switch. So the view manager, we have a base class that's called RCT view manager, and it already does the, the registration with the breed. So once you, you extend that class, uh, you already have a breed module that is specifically a view manager. Does React Native use storyboards? No, not at all. Why not? Uh, because if you you would have to create the views on the native side, right? And React is all about creating the views in a declarative way in the JavaScript side. So, absolutely. What is Flexbox? Uh, Flexbox is a CSS API that's uh, for for layout, and it's a it's very nice. Uh, it, it solves a lot of uh, old problems that the web had, like uh, centralizing text vertically and that kind of thing. It's a very it's a newer API. Uh, I think by now it's available on basically every every browser in the newest ones. Uh, and yeah, it was ported to C, Java, and JavaScript by Christopher Shudo that works at Facebook as well. It's another open source project. And how does how, like it's it's a CSS? It's for CSS. So. Why why is this relevant to React Native if this is for CSS? CSS is a, is a browser paradigm. Yeah, that's true. Uh, so we use Flexbox. We don't have like CSS. Uh, we don't have separate style sheets, but we do have uh, style attributes in the in the components. So the components can can be styled with layout and some CSS like properties and. Among, and some of them are flexbox related properties so you do have to to lay out your your components what you want they to look like and the way you do that is through flexbox interesting so we touched on this a little bit earlier but how is the threading model in react native different from the web and maybe this is more a discussion of ios's native threading model but um Yes, so we d we go a little bit f further than, than the native module than, than the iOS uh, threading model. Like the usually on the on iOS, you don't have that many threads, but uh, we do have like the JavaScript thread that's where the VM is running with your JavaScript code. We have the main thread that's where the layout happens. We have the layout thread that's called uh, internally we call it the shadow thread, and it has a representation of the of all the nodes you have in your in your tree of components and uh, and we still have uh, every native module has its own thread so we did that to avoid like people accidentally doing uh, slow operations either in any of those threads that that shouldn't be that shouldn't uh, stay all for for long times so every time you create a new module, it's assigned its own thread. So, yeah. How does a developer debug a React Native application? Uh, that's a good question. So we, so the first way you had to debug was they created an alternative executor. So an executor, you can have like multiple executors. An executor is where your JavaScript is running. So the default one is a uh, is JavaScript core. It's Apple's JavaScript VM, but you still can run uh, in a web view or in a web socket, uh, in, a, in the browser connected by web socket or in Node. Really, uh, you can run it anywhere. Uh, so since the the whole reads interface is realizable. You can just send that information to any JavaScript VM that knows how to, ex to execute it. So the way, the initial way to, to do that is uh, to run in Chrome and connect via WebSocket, and then you can use all the Chrome Dev tools that are very, very helpful. Is this workflow difficult to set up? Uh, if we're running on the device, it might be a little bit tricky. 
you have you might need to change your IP address in the application, some things like that. If you're running on the simulator, you just have to shake your device, shake your, your simulator. You, I mean, you have a shortcut to shake it, uh, and it will show a dev menu that has a lot of options. Uh, there's another ways of debugging that as well. I, I will mention, but one of them is like run on Chrome, and it will open Chrome for you and show some instructions on how to debug that. Is the IDE support for React Native uh, improving or under development? Uh, the IDE as in Euclid, you mean? Uh, I meant like interactive development environment, like Eclipse okay. support or okay. or uh, whatever, whatever people. What's uh, what's the IDE? Oh, Xcode, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, for native code, you still use Xcode. Like uh, at least most people still use it, I guess. Uh, you can debug the native code, breakpoints, uh, you have profilers, all this kind of stuff that's already in Xcode. Uh, for debugging the JavaScript, there's some work being done in Nuclide. Uh, Nuclide is Facebook's ID, and yeah, they are working a lot in React Native support, so it should be a very nice experience. Okay, very cool. How does React Native handle touch events? Uh, yeah, so we have our touch handler. I think Ben Alpert touched, uh, talked about a little bit about it uh, in the last two episodes ago. Yes. So yes. Uh, so we have our own touch handler that handles like raw touches. It's just like iOS uh, rendering, rendering touch handling system has like these gesture recognizers, and our touch handler is just one gesture recognizer that captures all the events and sends it to JavaScript. And we have uh, a pun, his pun responder, that's called. Uh, it's a JavaScript side. On the JavaScript side, you can create a pun responder to your view and, and uh, yeah, receive the gestures. Uh, I think he mentioned that see a little bit. Uh, you'll get stuff like raw touches. So we have the basic implementations like navigation, uh, tap, and that kind of things. But if you want to, to create a new one, it's a little bit, you still get like raw touches to, to create your, your experience. There's a phrase associated with React Native, learn once, write anywhere. What does this phrase mean? Yeah, I think the best example is that for that uh, ads manager. It's the Facebook uh, ads manager app. So it was uh, the first app released for, in Android with React Native Android. It was released, I think, one month ago, maybe a couple months ago, not sure. So it was also released first for with React Native iOS, and it was written by the same team. So the same team that wrote it on the web wrote the iOS version and the Android version. So with the same skill set, you can develop both uh, all the three, web, iOS, and Android. So, What are the common features that you can port from one area to the next or like how do how do you carry your knowledge from from one area to the next well all of them use uh react and react is a very very nice uh provides a very nice interface to build, to build components and i think once you learn how to structure your application in components and and how to to control the state of your application and I think that's uh, the, probably the most basic stuff that works in every three platforms. And you work on the iOS React Native team. What types of work are you doing lately? So most of the work I've done since I joined the team uh, was related to the bridge, threading models, and performance in general. So lately I've been working on profiler tools and that kind of thing. So right now we have two profilers, one marker-based, and then we have the JavaScript profiler that's uh, built into JSC. So I've been working both uh, creating tools and using this data to, to work on improving the performance of React Native. Can you give me an example of a performance issue that you encountered recently? Mm, let me think. Uh, yes, uh, so... It wasn't that recent. Uh, it's it's been probably a couple of months, but uh, it's a very good one. Uh, 
So the, in the layout code, we had some some options to register. Uh, so any view could know when. So in the life cycle, we get like the JavaScript calls in the native side, and we have to perform all that operations, right? So in the end, we have to check if anything is changed in the layout, so we have to re-render that. So it was possible to register before, like, any view could register to know when all the other views have been laid out, have, have the, when the layout pass has, had been done. So for that, we had to go to, like, all the component tree and call all the views to check, like, if they, they were subscribing to that event or not. So that was very expensive. We had to like traverse the whole tree, and it could take like uh, yeah tens of milliseconds on a very large tree. So we completely removed that and saved like more than five milliseconds per frame on the small trees, and it could go over thirty milliseconds. So your work sounds fairly low level. Did you have prior experience working at such a low level? Uh, that's a fun story. I was a JavaScript engineer before, so. <laughs> Yeah, I was a JavaScript engineer and I, I wanted to work on React, but I work in London and the React team is actually in, in, in California. So <laughs> I found about React Native and I wanted to join. And I had done some iOS apps before, but some very simple stuff. <laughs> and yeah, I, I, I thought I could do it. So now I work on that. <laughs> How is how is that uh, learning process? That sounds like a steep learning curve. Yeah, it, it was pretty fun actually. Like I met a lot of very nice people in the London office, very smart people. I've had a lot of help, and yeah, I, I always like it, like lower level stuff. Yeah, but I did. I hadn't had a chance, many chances to work at that level. Uh, and yeah, it was super rewarding. Like I've learned really, really a lot since I joined Facebook. So yeah, I'm really glad about that. Fascinating. Um, how, how did how did mobile app development at Facebook work before and after React Native? Because you know, I guess prior to React Native, there was this component kit, and I'm not sure what what how stuff worked with Android. But presumably, with React Native, stuff has changed a lot. Yeah, so one thing that's worth mentioning, uh, or at least uh, saying again, like Ben mentioned that, and that's something very that I really like about Facebook. So, uh, not all apps are written in React Native at Facebook yet. Like to be honest, it's a very small part of it yet. Sure. So there's a process of uh, a team. We have to convince the teams to to use React Native, and we have to just pick as many of them as we can support. Uh, at first, and then we we scale the framework. So now we have a few teams working with that already. Uh, it's it's super uh, nice to to see like uh, changing to to work on that change of of development culture. Uh, but yeah, it's a it's native development is still a really big thing at Facebook. So it hasn't completed switch over yet, but. Yeah, most people are really excited about it, and, and that's super nice. As you get people dog fooding this uh, React Native, do do you get a lot of uh, feedback? Like, do you get feature requests or like, hey, we can't use this because of X, and then you guys fulfill a feature request? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, especially at first when there's not that many small teams. Well, we get the ones that are willing to work very closely and provide very good feedback, so we can iterate like very fast on that and providing support for for the teams. Every feature that's missing, or but also part of the job is actually considering if the application is suitable is suitable for for React Native or not. Do, do you have maybe, any examples of? Oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, yeah, maybe React Native React Native might not be the best choice for. For the app that for that team's app, so yeah, we definitely consider that. Do Do you have any examples of uh, a development team, you know, not being able to use React Native, and then coming to you guys and saying, "Hey, we need this," and then you guys implement it, and then the the team is able to use React Native? Mm. Yeah, I mean. Most of the teams, uh, as we decide to, to go with React Native, 
we already have some some things that we will have to support. Uh, now we are, of course, we are we are there's a lot of people working on that, so we try to to get to get more features known. So it happens less often, but yeah, that definitely happens. Like I don't have one case in mind, but sure, most of the sure. time, once we we decide to go with React Native, there there are already some features that have to be implemented. For the developers who are switching to React Native or moving some of their application components to React Native, what is the experience like? What is the brownfield app uh, re- reformatting process like? Yeah, so as React, one thing nice about React Native is that you don't have to rewrite your whole application to start using React Native. You can have like a simple small view of using React Native and the whole app can be uh, native. So that's cool because it allows people to, to experiment with that and iterate, iterate a little bit slower if, if they don't have the bandwidth to just like rewrite the whole app with, of course, most of the time it's not a very good idea. Like, uh, yeah, most people can't do it, right? So like, yeah, React Native came out and I'm just going to rewrite this whole app. Uh, yeah, it's not... It's not always possible. So you can start slower and you can create one view with React Native and scale it up. And there is this kind of dream situation where you have a web developer and an iOS developer and an Android developer and they're all sitting there having lunch together and discussing the components that they're working on together. Uh, Has this happened in reality? Have you had examples where, like, you know, three engineers from the three areas of development come together and and are able to really coordinate and improve the uh, efficiency process? Because traditionally, like, these three groups end up in silos. Yeah, well, that's pretty much how you work, right? So we, in London, we have the iOS and Android teams, and the JavaScript team is in California, but both we go there and they come here uh, reasonably often. And yeah, we definitely discuss everything together. We have like meetings every week, and we always talk about that kind of thing. So it's for for the for the React Native thing, it's already happening. So it's super nice. Okay, um, what else could you tell me about the uh, the difference between the Android React Native project and the iOS React Native project? So yeah, there's. I haven't uh, I haven't used React Native Android yet. Uh, I have, I, as I mentioned, we talk a lot. So, uh, but there's few things different. Like uh, for the developer, we do a lot of stuff in iOS with macros and some some Objective C uh, runtime things that that are not possible in Android, or would be very expensive. So, like looking up all the modules at runtime and, and creating all of them. And in Android, you have like uh, a little bit more, you have to create the modules and, and specify the modules you are using. Some people could see it as a, as a benefit, other not. So yeah, there's a few differences, but yeah, someone posted like a very nice uh, tweet about it the other day. So it's not that different, so you can still uh, code your application logic in JavaScript and have both simulators running on the same application, and you have like coding, you and you are coding iOS and Android at the same time with one editor. So, how does React Native fit in with Relay and GraphQL? Uh, yeah, so Relay is being used on on I think all of the React Native applications that we have internally, and uh, GraphQL is being used for quite a while already in, in Facebook. So, uh, but yeah, React Native, we were, we worked quite closely with the Relay team as well to, to provide all the support they needed and it's fully compatible with React Native and they definitely go very well together. What do you personally like about Relay? I really like the idea of having your, your, your query right beside your component. It makes very clear uh, what you were using, so it's very hard to to have like overfetching or underfetching for for that matter. I think that's a very nice feature, especially when you have like a very big app. It's very very easy to just wait to just waste uh, tons of megabytes of unused fields. 
Yeah, definitely. So I'd like to hear more about working on the React Native development team. Are there any interesting aspects to how the team is managed? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's the first team I joined at Facebook. Uh, but, yeah, it's not very different from, from the other teams I've seen. One very nice thing about Facebook is that most of the time you can just uh, choose what you want to work with. And it's very, very... Uh, relaxing it's a very very relaxed environment so yeah at first it was a little bit different i came from a very small company so but basically you just find what interests you and you start working on that it's a super nice experience and i guess that that helps like you always have people working on what they like i think that's a very nice thing for the team can you talk more about the movement from a small company to a big company or i guess Specifically, Facebook, because Facebook is unlike other big companies. Yeah, I was a little bit like skeptical at first. Uh, I definitely wanted. I've I want. I tried to join Facebook once before. I couldn't join because of visa issues. And uh, this time I came to London. Uh, the visa situation here is definitely much 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 easier than the US. And it's a super nice experience. Like uh, I was really surprised to see like. It's such a big company, how people are really, really will, willing to help you. Uh, even for the, in the interview process, uh, it, was, it was one of the best interviews I've had. People are really helpful, where sometimes in other small companies where you feel that it should be more personal, it's, it's not always like that. So I, I really like Facebook. Uh, personally, it's a very nice company. And being that big, it also has some benefits. So most people, I guess, think about the, the problems like the very big company. But uh, I, at least in my experience, I don't think that the overhead is that big. And it definitely has a lot of benefits. Uh, have you talked to other people about like how Facebook compares to other giant companies like Google or Microsoft or uh, Amazon? Like how these different giant, almost faceless uh, companies compare to one another? Because I think a lot of times they just get lumped into the same basket and it's like, oh yeah, you work at one you work at one company, it's like you're working at any of them. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, I haven't worked in any of those companies, so it's, it's from what I've heard, so it's always hard to, to, to be precise, but yeah, at least from, from the experience, from the people I met, uh, it's it's less uh, Facebook's less. Uh, there's less bureaucracy. There's less overhead. Uh, people are very relaxed. So uh, really, for me, it doesn't feel like I'm working in a company that big. You met people all the time, and there's no like, there's no that infinite level of managers of managers of managers. Yeah. It's it's very it's in a very open environment. You just uh, message anyone at Facebook and you go talk to them and people are very open. So that's a super nice thing. There's no there's no people that you can't talk to. It's it's very nice. Yeah, that's the impression I get is that it's like actually exponentially more open and better compared to these other giant companies. But um, we don't have to keep talking about that. So I'm, I'm curious, what is the reaction... Uh, from the open source community uh, been like to what what is the reaction from the open source community been to react native it's been like very very exciting and very impressive people really loved it so when react was first released people were a little bit skeptical like yeah you have like xml inside your javascript and now people are really over it and most of the reactions were very were really good we have like a lot of people contributing in the repo, so we have a lot of open source uh, contributors. Some people that uh, already help us like uh, actually deal with the with the repo. Uh, there is people like closing issues all the time. Other people are acting on issues, and it's super nice. It's been really really. What's the open source strategy or the open source policy of Facebook? Uh, 
Yeah, so we try to, to just open source what we are using internally, what we have tested and proved to work. So by the time we open sourced React Native for iOS, we had already uh, published like three apps in React Native iOS. So for Android, we had already published one app, the Ads Manager. Uh, of course, with React Native, there's some caveats, like there's components that we have our own version internally that we're never going to have. We're not using the, the open source one, but we still have to provide that. Uh, otherwise, it would be, uh, it would impact a very, very badly the community. Like, uh, like we have our own network stack, but how can we provide a framework without a network uh, connection component? Like, okay, here's just React Native, but you can't, you can't request anything from the network. You have to write your own like network layer. Uh, so those things are, are the exceptions, but for all the other projects, we just open source what we have used internally already. So it sounds like this very gradual open sourcing process, but I'm curious, like, is there is there some sort of un, like universal roadmap where you know external developers, external open source developers, can look at the React Native? code and then they can look at the roadmap and be like oh this needs to be built and then they can build something and submit a a pull request or is the development roadmap not that transparent uh yeah i mean it's not just about being transparent Uh, i don't think we have that we talk openly about what we are what we are working on and what we are going to work next i don't think we have that uh written anywhere but it's always like anyone can open an issue and ask like if it's going to be implemented and we are going to be like very, very open about it. Like either, sorry, we, we can't work on that now. We have like uh, some other things to work first. And definitely if you feel like, like working on that, uh, we, we will be very, very happy to help. So with that said, what is the future of React Native? Oh, that's that's a hard question, but yeah, I think that we we want to provide the better ex- developer experience possible. Uh, we want to get as close as possible to the to native performance, and I think those are the two things we are we are wor- we are working mostly towards. And yeah, like all the you should have all the tools that that you have in the web development and in native development, and you should still be able to write in an application as performant as if you had written native code. What is the roadmap to a Facebook operating system? I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> I can't I get you. I, You're not going to speculate on it? No, not really. I'm not good at speculating. Do you, Are you good at <laughs> private speculation? Do you, do you privately speculate? No, not really. Uh, <laughs> okay, you're a diplomat. <laughs> <laughs> you Facebook folks, you're all diplomats. Except with Chris- Christopher Shadow. I when I interviewed him and Sebastian, he, Christopher said something about like GPUs, like getting React to, to interface directly with GPUs. I was like, what the hell is he talking about? I had no idea what he was <laughs> talking about. Uh, it sounded very ambitious, and I, I wish I were more well-versed in the topic and could have engaged him more, but that's my fault, I guess. Um, <laughs> ha- have you heard anything about GPU interfacing? Uh, yeah, I've heard about some experience. People working on, yeah, GL-based renderers and things like that, but o- both in open source as well, so yeah, that's definitely something interesting, but... I'm really not aware of that. Because, so. I mean, it sounds like if you can interface with a GPU, you don't need, like, Android or iOS. Uh, no, wait. Is no, that accurate? Or? I, well, it might be a little bit more complex than that. Uh, if you can talk directly to the GPU, if you don't need Android or iOS... I'm I'm not sure. I, I don't think that's quite how it works. You you still have a lot of other stuff, other components like 
uh, people have talked about uh, just writing like compiling apps directly to binary code and and just shipping it but that's not exactly how it works there's we still have the operating systems and we still want to support that platforms and you can't just bypass anything like there's a lot of limitations that the OS gives us and we have no way to bypass things like for iOS the only way you can print something is like by open the the share sheet and that's there's the only way of doing that so if you try to bypass it your app will not be accepted so yeah there's things that we can't we can't avoid so that's like all the more reason to have a some sort of like replacement for like I, iOS and Android. I don't know. It's like these. I, I've switched. I, I switch back and forth between phones every every other you know every two years or whatever. Every obsolescence cycle, I go from iOS to Android. And with both of these things, I'm like, these things are crap. Like these are not as good as they need to be. And it's it's kind of sucks. Like I think people are sort of sick of the duopoly. So. Uh, maybe if if Facebook is not working on some sort of hardware device, can can I like can this be like a feature request like for <laughs> a hardware device? You can yeah. consider this podcast episode a feature request. I I can forward your message. What are the things that you do not like about developing on the iOS platform? Yeah, I think layouting is something pretty hard in iOS. I've never liked the the kind of drag and drop uh, layout based uh, layout development. So I really hate like opening the the I don't, can't even remember the interface builder and, and dragging stuff around. And once you try to build all the logic yourself, like uh, with just like creating the objects and positioning them on the screen, it's super hard. Uh, it's a lot of code. It's a lot of boilerplate code. Uh, they came up with auto layout, and as I heard, to do that, to programmatically do that is also it's even more boilerplate code. So yeah. I haven't I haven't used auto layout, not uh, not directly, not in code. So, but yeah, that was something that I always found like very painful. So, interesting. Well, uh, Tadeu Zagallo, thanks for coming on to Software Engineering Daily. It's been really interesting chatting with you about React Native. Yeah, thanks again for inviting me. It was very nice.